So I think we've made the case by now that the reason that the transpose shows up in the question of projecting a point onto a subspace is that the transpose tells us something in linear algebra about orthogonality. In other words, whether or not one thing is perpendicular to another thing. And because perpendicularity is so fundamental to the question of projecting onto a subspace, maybe it's no surprise that the transpose has come to the table. What I want to use this video to do is establish a relationship between the properties of a matrix A, i.e., the properties of the linear transformation that A defines from one vector space to another. I want to relate those properties to the properties of its transposed matrix, A transpose. We'll have a list of relationships of properties that is a little bit technical. So this goes into the linear algebra weeds uh, quite a bit. Um, but all of these properties are so foundational to the properties of linear transformations in linear algebra that this video might be worth watching and re-watching, um, maybe once now, once again later on in the semester, when you're a little bit more brushed up on your linear algebra. So I'm going to start, just to try to keep things concrete in this video, we're going to look at the properties of the matrix A, which has entries 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6. So this matrix uh, has three rows, two columns. It's 3 by 2. Its transpose, therefore, is 2 by 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, exchanging the columns with the rows. So what are the relationships that we can find between the properties of this matrix and the properties of that matrix? They look awfully similar but they actually do quite different things and can have different properties from one another even though those properties are related in ways that we're about to see. First things first. Starting from the matrix A on the left hand side here, because my matrix has three rows and two columns, it defines a linear transformation from two-dimensional space into three-dimensional space because I can multiply this matrix on the right by an element of R2. And, pre and then get an element of R3 out of that matrix product. So that's the reason that this matrix defines a linear transformation that takes in its domain elements of R2 and spits out in its range elements of R3. OK, well, if that's the case, then if I turn that matrix on its side, where I used to have a matrix with three rows and two columns, now I have two rows and three columns. And therefore, a transpose gives a linear transformation going the opposite direction. So it can take for me a vector which has three components and multiply by it and produce for me a vector with two components as the result. So in that way, A and A transpose define linear transformations on the same pair of vector spaces but going in opposite directions. A here is going from R2 into R3, A transpose going back from R3 into R2. The manner in which this happens, just as a reminder of how matrices and linear transformations are related, Let's suppose that I pick the standard basis vectors back in R2, 1, 0, and 0, 1, respectively. If I apply A to each of those two vectors, then what I'm going to get are their images in R3. A times 1, 0 is going to give me 1, 2, 3, the first column of A. A times 0, 1 is going to give me 4, 5, 6, the second column of A. For that reason, if I take the set of all linear combinations of those vectors, I'm going to get, in this case, a plane inside of R3, which we call, by definition, the column space of A. And because every vector in R2 is some linear combination of 1, 0, and 0, 1, that means that any vector that we can obtain by multiplying by a matrix A is going to be some linear combination of this vector and that vector. That's why the column space of A is exactly the same thing as the range of the linear transformation, or the range of the function, which relates x to ax. Likewise, if we think about A transpose by itself, its columns tell us the images of the standard basis vectors in R3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. If I multiply A transpose by 1, 0, 0, I get the first column of A transpose, 1, 4. Multiply it by the second standard basis vector, I get the second column. Third standard basis vector gives me the third column. And if I take the set of all linear combinations of those images, what I get is the column space of A transpose. In this case, that happens to also be a two-dimensional plane, which is going to cover all of R2. But because the columns of A are the rows of A transpose and vice versa, the rows of A are the columns of A transpose, 
The column space of A transpose is also known as the row space of A. So we've set up a picture here where A is transforming vectors from its row space onto its column space going from left to right. A transpose is transforming vectors from its row space, which is the column space of A, onto its column space, which is the row space of A, going from right to left. When I multiply a matrix by a vector on the right, as we conventionally do, what I get is always a linear combination of the columns of that matrix. So if I multiply A by a vector x on the right, the result is going to be a linear combination of the columns of A. Likewise, if I multiply A transpose by some vector on the right, I'm going to get a linear combination of the columns of A transpose. But the columns of A transpose are nothing more than the rows of A. So as we established, every product A times x is going to live in the column space of A, where every product A transpose times y is going to live in the row space of A. Fact number three is going to give us the orthogonality connection that we're looking for. When I multiply A by a vector x, the entries that I get in that matrix product are exactly the dot products of x with the rows of A. Just to see this in an example, here's A. Let me take some vector x, like negative 3, 7, and form the matrix product. When I form the matrix product, multiplying across the rows and down the column, the arithmetic that I wind up with can be rearranged in such a way as, for example, to make this first row 1 times negative 3 plus 4 times 7. That's really the same thing as the vector 1, 4 dotted with the vector negative 3, 7. Likewise for the second row, and likewise for the third row. So the entries of the matrix AX are the dot products of X with the rows of A. Therefore, since the dot product has the ability to measure angle, the matrix product A times X measures, in some sense, the angle in between X and the rows of the matrix A. In other words, it might measure the angle between X and the row space of A, thought of as a linear subspace. So if we flip the rows with the columns, we get exactly the opposite story. If I multiply A transpose by some randomly selected vector, then going across the row, down the column, getting all of our arithmetic in place, the entries of that product are the dot products of the rows of A transpose with the vector that we chose. But the rows of A transpose are nothing more than the columns of A. So when I multiply A transpose by a vector, I'm not measuring the angle between x and the rows of A. I'm measuring the angle between x and the columns of A. So anytime I have a question about the angle in between a vector and the rows of A, I should look at the product AX. Whereas if I want the angle between X and the columns of A, I should look at the product A transpose times X. Our final two facts are the big ones. They relate to the systems of equations that these matrices define, and to what extent uh, those e uh, systems of equations have unique solutions. Let's start with the solvability question. Do solutions of the linear system exist necessarily? So we know from the basic principles of linear algebra that a system AX equals B is guaranteed to have a solution exactly when the rows of A each have a pivot. If I have a pivot in every row of the matrix A, then I am guaranteed to have a solution to AX equals B. Because to get a no solution, we need to be able to do Gaussian elimination and get a row of all zeros, which we can then make equal to something which is not zero. It gives us inconsistency. So if we flip that script around, a transpose defines a linear system which is going to be solvable exactly when all of the rows of a transpose have a pivot. But all the rows of a transpose having pivots are the same as having a pivot in every column of A. Let's get our picture back in play here and see what this all means pictorially. So how do we know when our system is guaranteed to have a solution? Using our example from before. So A is the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in the columns. So its column space is two-dimensional. And it looks like this. A transpose going in the opposite direction. Its column space is also two-dimensional. But it goes from R3 to R2. Now. The matrix A, if we do the Gaussian elimination on it, 
subtracting twice the first row from the second row, three times the first row from the third row. That's going to zero out the column underneath my 1 in the upper left-hand corner. Immediately, I can identify that my matrix is going to have two pivots, and therefore the rank of A is equal to 2. Recall that what that means is it means that the column space of A is a two-dimensional subspace of the codomain. And likewise, because every row has a pivot, the column space of A transpose, which is the same as the row space of A, is also a two-dimensional subspace. But here, a two-dimensional subspace of the xy plane, which is an important fact. So what does this have to do with the solvability of the systems of equations that we see here? The question is, is it possible for me to pick a b such that ax cannot equal b? In this case, the example is yes. If I pick this b, for example, where I've kind of drawn it as though b is outside of the column space of a, because the column space of a consists of all a times x's that we could ever dream up, if b is outside of that column space, then b cannot be made equal to any ax. So ax equals b will be inconsistent in this example. There's too much room in R3 for us to pick a b which is outside the column space of a. On the other hand, the same cannot be said of a transpose. Because the column space of a transpose makes up all of the xy plane, any point in the xy plane that I pick is going to automatically belong to the column space of a transpose. Therefore, because all c belong to the column space of a transpose, the system a transpose y equals c will always be consistent. So here's a possible contrast between the properties of a and the properties of a transpose. In this example, ax equals b might be inconsistent. But a transpose defines a linear system which is always consistent. Finally, now that we've established a result about existence, let's think about uniqueness. Under what circumstances are solutions to these linear systems unique when they exist? Uniqueness depends now not on whether or not the rows of A are linearly independent or whether the rows of A have pivots, but conversely, whether the columns all have pivots. If there is a pivot in every column of A, that means that the linear system defined by A will have no free variables. All the variables will be bound. And the existence of a free variable is exactly what makes solutions to a system of equations not unique when they exist. So we need all the variables in ax equals b to be bound, and none of them to be free. So we need every column of a to have a pivot. So of course, if we're asking the same question about a transpose, a transpose y equals c will have unique solutions when all the rows of a have a pivot. So what you might be noticing right now is the following connection. That ax equals b being always consistent is an equivalent condition with a transpose y equals c always having unique solutions. These two things occur together. And conversely, the same is also true about ax equals b having unique solutions and a transpose always being consistent. Those two are equivalent conditions, one to another. So let's think more about why this gives us the uniqueness that we're looking for, and that will wrap up this laundry list of linear algebraic results. So why should we expect that unique solutions to ax equals b are guaranteed by having a pivot in every column? And particularly here, I want to think about how this relates to our orthogonality result, in other words, how do we connect this with transposes in a way that's geometric? So going back to our example of the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in the columns, let's imagine that I'm looking at the linear system ax equals b. The question is, is it possible for there to be more than one different solution to the system ax equals b? So on the right-hand side, and in R3, there's enough room left over from the column space of A to find a vector y, and here I chose the vector negative 1, 2, negative 1. We can verify that that vector is actually perpendicular to both of the columns of A. Just check that y dotted with 1, 2, 3 gives you 0, so y is perpendicular to 1, 2, 3, and that y dotted with 4, 5, 6 is also 0, so y is perpendicular to 4, 5, 6. So since y is perpendicular to the columns of A, that means that when I multiply a transpose times y, 
all of the entries, which are the dot products of y with the columns of a, are going to be 0. But if a transpose y is equal to 0, then there is no difference between a transpose times x and a transpose of the quantity x plus y. Therefore, the system a transpose y equals c will have non-unique solutions, because all it takes for us to find two different elements on the right-hand side in R3, which have the same image on the left-hand side under a transpose, is just to add y to a solution. So 1, 0, 0, for example, hits 1, 4 when we multiply it by a transpose. But so too does 1, 0, 0 plus negative 1, 2, negative 1. 0, 2, negative 1 has the same image under a transpose as 1, 0, 0 does. So we do not get unique solutions for a transpose y equals c. On the other hand, if we think about the question um, in, in the other sense, is there a non-zero vector in R2 which is perpendicular to both of the rows of A? And the answer to this is no, it's, it's not possible. Actually, I should say uh, all three of the rows of A. That's what this should say. My apologies. Perpendicular to all rows of A. And it's not possible because all rows of A cover all of the xy plane. So there is no non-zero x, which is perpendicular to every element in the uh, column space of A transpose, or the row space of A. And so if I have two vectors, x and y, that have the same image under A, if ax is equal to ay, then that means that A times the vector x minus y must be the zero vector. But since the only vector which is perpendicular to all the rows of A must be the zero vector itself, this must mean, since x minus y is perpendicular to the rows of A according to this, that x minus y is the zero vector and hence x is equal to y. So the system Ax equals b is guaranteed to have unique solutions in a situation like this one. But that's only if it's consistent, right? If Ax equals b does not have a solution, then it doesn't have a unique solution. But when a solution exists, it's guaranteed to be unique. So this list of properties describes a whole bunch of things that we might need to know about the relationship between a matrix A and its transpose A transpose. The last thing we need to do then is establish what is the magic, the special nature behind the matrix product A transpose times A that makes the normal equations do what they do.